I came to the Royal College as an observer because I'd been working um, in a commercial holography company trying to develop it uh, as a medium for making some kind of product. But I'd always had one eye on the art world because that's my true love. Yeah. And it was just great to be able to come to the Royal College and see people do such creative work. You know, drop in and um, have a look at the latest plates on the drying rack um, see people coming out of the dark room with their latest thing again, holding up to the light and just sharing that excitement. And as the new processes became um, perfected, seeing all the really brilliant things people were, were doing with it, and going to the degree shows and seeing what they were most pleased with. Just a thrilling time to be around. There was, because there were, bef before that in England, holography had been technically quite accomplished, but creatively sort of really nowhere. I mean, it was, this, it was the small dead thing or the pulse portrait of in green. Yes. Um, and it all, that all started to change. You, know, you have to say, well, the Royal College had a de department for 10 years and then it ended. And after that, there's been nothing in public education, apart from what you're doing now and what Pearl's doing. Um, you know, it's not widespread. So that compared to any other medium you can think of, the numbers of people practicing holography is minuscule, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Compared to, uh, everyone's a photographer now. Yes. And everybody at some point has held a pen or a paintbrush and tried to make a painting, even if it was only when they were two years old. Holography, who, who's had a, a chance to make a hologram? Okay, so we've got a laser beam. You're both tall enough not to get it right in your eye, but try to avoid, you know, looking down into it as we used to, because that's not a good idea. Okay, so now we're getting some effects here. If you come around here, always point the camera towards the beam. This particular red laser is called a helium neon, and it's called helium neon. If you imagine a, a fluorescent tube being full of a different type of gas instead of being filled with xenon, uh, this is filled with helium neon. The reason it's red is because when the energy particles become excited, they jump to a high state and they tend to move into the, the red region. So uh, this particular type of laser is incredibly stable um, ideal for people beginning to make holograms because when you when you uh, record a hologram you're looking for light of a very pure source a very pure sort of frequency and helium neon is used because it's fairly inexpensive and gives you a, a good result every time but obviously you know red uh, single color holograms are, are primarily what we were creating 30, 40 years ago yeah. and technology has moved on tremendously since then. So in a moment we're going to turn on a, a green diode laser uh, which is five times as powerful of this, as this and in terms of, you know, just to give you an example here how the technology is developed um, 20 years ago I was using a, a green laser which was two meters long it was water cooled and cost sixty thousand pounds today we're using a diode laser which is the size of a matchbox and is is air cooled for twelve thousand pounds so the the opportunities you know for creating holograms are opening up for new people coming into the, the medium i can remember the, the first um day of the the pulse laser being operational in the holography unit it's and been really liberating in, incredibly uh, liberating much excitement nobody knew for sure you know what was going to happen and um, I'd already assembled a, a collection of objects which I'd recorded previously using a continuous wave process which basically means you know if anything moves as much as a micron in the space of a second the object becomes black and the, the huge advantage with the, the pulse laser was for the first time we could record people, we could record anything that was moving, you know, water droplets, um, any form of life. So I'd, I'd assembled this tray of objects that I'd been recording for the past two years 
And in what, a, what's Steve Benton used to call small dead things? Small dead, yeah, exactly, small dead things. Um, and in a moment of naughtiness, balanced it on my head <laughs> and fired the pulse laser, and, and we got one of my best known images, which was Mathematical Chef. And I think Mathematical Chef is in the show. Yeah. Um, and the incredible excitement in, in seeing oneself recorded as a hologram. Like it's it's a, an indescribable experience. It's it's almost like hearing your voice on tape for the first time. In, you know, it's weird because you know it's you, but it doesn't sound like you. Hmm. And there's there's a, a this horrible feeling of not liking it, but at the same time being incredibly drawn to it. I was very influenced by Margaret Benyon's work. Um, and the way that she drew attention to the, um, the surface of the holographic um, plate um, so that uh, her work sort of referenced the fact that there was a world inside the hologram. Um, uh, it was, you called it a, a time window um, today. Um, and, um, and then there's the space external to the, to the hologram. And what Margaret's work did was to draw attention to that. I mean, she had one beautiful hologram where um, she had a, a hand touching the surface of the plate from behind the plate and a hand projecting in front of the plate and touching the front of that. Um, and so um, I was very, very influenced by that use of space within the holograms. I suppose, I suppose what I was um, doing was trying to break away from holograms of objects mm -hmm. and I didn't really make very many holograms of objects at all as far as I remember. There was great pressure wasn't there to have the brightest of, of holograms and a real focus on the, um, the technical quality. Yeah. But not enough discussion of, of um, Aesthetic. aesthetics. I think in many ways we, we were very lucky compared to perhaps Martin's generation in that I think that they'd solved most of the problems. We had good plates, we had good yeah. chemistry, yeah. we had good lasers, we had good optics and, and um, I think it would have been much much more difficult for us had we been in that kind of initial pioneering sort of sand table thing. In, mm. in many ways we walked into a kind of um, sort of uh, pre-made setup. The, Fabulous facilities. I mean, the, the, the one sort of te technical thing that changed when we were there was that years before um, they'd uh, muted this, this idea of a stereogram system mm. whereby you can make holograms from photographic sequences. Yeah. And that, that hologram of the sign signing person was of that yeah, technique. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I, I haven't seen that hologram for years. But I've got it, yeah. I've heard. It. <laughs> but, it, I mean, it did look like a little human being. It's, it's incredible. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I still don't think um, there are many ways of replicating that to this day. Mm. It, I mean, it really does look like a... Um, a person in your hand uh, it is remarkable for, for, for that for those qualities okay we'll give it a couple of seconds to settle so there's no movement at all we should be okay i'm then going to remove the uh, baffle and expose for five seconds in silence we then replace the baffle and we're we'll going to the dark room and process Bit of history. Here's my notes. Ah. This is a Royal College original. <laughs> to give them a, a disclaimer. So we'd read out this like 10 rules, right? Um, things you must and must not do. And then you sign away your life at the end. And by the end of that, 
if you haven't run out the door, you know, you're okay. Why don't we use one of the old formulas here, okay? Let's go for this one. So we start with EDTA. And this is where I found working with chemists really interesting because, you know, I what, yeah, what, what does EDTA mean? Well, it's a suspension fluid. And things like metal is a, gives you a greater contrast if you want a really sharp image of a face. Sodium carbonate, it cracks open the, the molecules of silver. You know, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Every one of those chemicals does something different to the molecular structure of the, um, the, the gelatin. Yeah. Okay, because I want this hologram to work. Okay, I'm not cutting corners here. I'm going to mix this properly. So EDTA, right? EDTA. Let's try another 500 one for now. You know, if we were ever going to do it again, it would be totally different. But it could be equally great because of digital technology. Yeah. Really. Because the whole philosophy of new media is, is holographic. It's multi-view, it's, um, you know, how, how does it look from your point of view? It's not, you know, as in 2D and to a certain extent 3D, uh, dictatorial about where you should stand and what you should perceive it's about. It's more about reality. So... I believe this type of phenomenon that we're witnessing here will eventually be the key to new technologies like holographic television, interactivity, you know, augmented holography, moving in that area where people can actually interact with um, the wave fronts. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at wave fronts. And if I've learned anything from, you know, being involved in in this technology so far is is wise not to stray too far away from the science. The next challenge that holography faces is to become integrated into new media yeah. in a way which I know uh, digital technology is, is allowing. So digital holograms, uh, interactivity, I already mentioned that, um, and applying it to real things in architecture, for example, in flooring and safety mechanisms, in medicine. There's, the list is endless. And, you know, the big question is, well, why? Well, holography offers us the, is basically the most advanced image making process for information capture that mankind has ever developed. Yeah. Holography, has been invented, it won't become uninvented, it's just going to grow and grow. That Good. argument um, that was constantly sort of reiterated around holography is that it, it you know, potentially it was pointless because you were just recreating things that were already there, I thought was a complete non-argument because, because through the process it was transformative mm. in, in the same way as taking a photograph of something it isn't, isn't the thing itself mm. it doesn't matter how good the colour reproduction is or how sharp it is it's clearly, it's clearly not the thing mm. the uniqueness of the holographic imaging process you know, I, I think it's completely untapped still uh, and because there's not enough people doing it uh, and uh, there isn't access to the facilities. Yes. yes. I think we've also got to re remember what was going on in London at the time. You know, uh, we were working with video uh, recordings for the first time ever, giant cameras that we could carry around. It was very much a time of audio visual, trying to lay down some, you know, early concepts of you know, what space was and experimenting with space and time. And of course, um, I think... Uh, it was, a, it was, financially speaking, it was a time when people could do more or less anything they wanted to. You know, we were going through the period of the 80s, Margaret Thatcher, um, Jocelyn Stevens was uh, elected to be the, the, the rector of the Royal College of Art. And it just felt like there, there was ample money to, to really do things which we couldn't do before. And it was during that period that we decided to purchase the first uh, high-powered pulse lasers which didn't come cheap, they were, you know, over £100,000 each.
Yeah. The other aspect was we were given amazing access to materials that we weren't paying for. Um, we had Duncan Crouch from Agford who saw uh, a potential mass market for holography and so sponsored you know, much of the materials mm-hmm. that we were able to use. And of course this meant we, we, we'd get into the labs at 8 o'clock in the morning and just work through until 10 o'clock at night. Shaking we'd all like go up crazy. Yeah. Making holograms like crazy, um, you know, offering our skills, our, this wonderful medium we were working with to other people involved in fashion and photography and, and graphics. And, um, um, you know, the opportunity, I think, was there for a, for a much longer lasting um, form of degree. Um, ultimately, my final analysis of, you know, the holographer unit, I've, I've got to say, is that it was a victim of its own success. You know, people became so good at doing what they did, a majority of the talent left. It has a strong visual language, but um, not enough people speak the language or see the holograms. That's the, that's the problem. Um, well, I, I think when, educating people when, when you're trying to attract that. people to talk about it in, mm-hmm. in, in the media, you know, they haven't got anything to refer to, yeah. uh, which is all what they always want to do. If you take a photograph, they will refer mm-hmm. back to a previous photographer. If they look at film, they will refer, refer to a film because it's got that historical background. And, and it's a combination of there not being enough holography and, and then not knowing what it yes. is, has been. I think that, you know, perhaps, as Martin was alluding to, the holography had a sort of uh, subconscious um, uh, sort of preliminary of, uh, influence on, on some of the things that are coming out now being done electronically rather than through an analogue process. I, th- I think you're absolutely right about, you know, young people coming into the medium. Um, I'm working, at, as you know, as a, a professor now at the Montford University, and part of the challenge we, we have is how do we integrate holography into the real world? Um, so we're looking at uh, new materials that we can record holograms into, things like photopolymers, uh, uh, super sensitive nanotechnology. Since the days of the Royal College, where lasers were enormously huge and expensive, we're now working with diode lasers which come in the size of a matchbox. So the technology's moved on a huge quantum leap. And I think one has to be aware that, you know, young people coming to the medium now have also, you know, they've grown through that. They have a new vision of the world where um, things are much easier. And I think the challenges of, of integrating holography into the real world are less, are less daunting because of that. If we look at where we are today, you know, 2012, holography is everywhere. Everyone has a credit card. Uh, we've got holograms on banknotes. I know it's coming from a different industry, but still, you know, the use of holography is in everyday items around us.